Hello and welcome to today's webinar, The Simplest Route to Security and Compliance, How North American Multinationals Are Responding to Regulatory Compliance. I'm Teresa Resick, the Director of Webinars here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And with me today are John Mancini from AIM, and from Gimmel we have Susan Sisko and Cynthia Wood. And Gimmel is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. And as we get started, just want to offer a few tips for participating in today's webinar. By joining the webinars live, you can customize your own viewing experience, so feel free to open, close, or resize the different windows. And across the bottom of your screen is a list of all of the widgets that are available to you. And group chat is one of those that are, that's available to you, and just open that by opening the icon that's along the bottom. And with group chat, you'll be able to text chat with each other, as well as with a few of us here for, at AIM. Do ask questions to the speakers throughout the hour using the Q&A feature, and that's to the left of your slide area. And we'll hold these questions until the end where we should have about five or ten minutes to answer them. You can also use that feature to ask for to any technical assistance. You can download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list, and there's also a number of other documents and links in there to help you learn more about today's topic. Just click in there at any time, and that resource will open in a new browser tab. And you can save that and read all that material after the webinar. And at the end of this webinar, a brief survey will open in your browser and would appreciate it if you would take a few moments to offer your feedback and to suggest other topics for us to cover. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to AIM.org's Resources Webinars page in just a few days. I want to take this opportunity now to introduce the panel of speakers that we have with us today. And first up, I'm going to introduce John Mancini, and he is the Chief Evangelist and Past President of AIM. And he is a well-known author and speaker on information management and digital transformation. As a frequent keynote speaker, John offers his expertise on digital transformation and the struggle to overcome information chaos. He blogs under the title Digital Landfill and has published more than 15 e-books, e many of which can be found at aim.org slash research. Susan Sisko is a consultant with Gimmel and brings more than 30 years of experience in the records and information management field as a practitioner, educator, consultant. And she has successfully consulted organizations in multiple industries, including the oil and gas industry, hospitality, healthcare, insurance, utilities, and government. Susan holds a PhD in library and information science. Her work is in the application her work in the application of the Big Bucket approach to the classification and retention of electronic records enhances the usability of eCRM systems, simplifies deployment strategies, and optimizes user adoption. And then we also have with us Cynthia Wood, who is the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Gimmel. Cynthia has over 30 years of experience in software and system integration. And prior to Gimmel, she worked in business development and leadership roles with several web development and systems integration firms. Cynthia began her career in the energy, in the energy industry, working with graphic information systems, document management, and computer-aided drafting to support upstream exploration, production, and natural gas transmission at a time when organizations were just moving from paper to electronic systems. So right now, I'm going to turn things over to John Mancini, because uh, he's going to be emceeing the rest of our event for, for us today. John? Thank you, Teresa. It's really a pleasure to be here today. I've really been looking forward to this particular webinar, because the topic is so timely and so current, and I think it's really an exciting combination of resources that we have here. I'm really glad to have Gimmel involved in this. Um, AIM has worked with Gimmel for a number of years, going way, way back when. Gimmel developed our SharePoint training program, and uh, Mike Alsop has been on the board for um, a couple of times. And so it's really a special thing to have Gimmel involved, and I do appreciate uh, the Gimmel folks sponsoring it. And uh, also, it's nice to get connected with uh, with Susan. We uh, Susan typically travels more in uh, um, our friends over at Arma, and uh, so we're glad to welcome her over here into the AIM environment. And um, um, at some point, maybe we'll bring these two worlds together at long last. But as um, you all think about the content today, there's there's three things that I wanted to 
stick in your heads maybe is just kind of something to think about, you know. And uh, I'll go through and give some introductory comments about GDPR and about privacy um, just so that people kind of understand um, the context if you're not familiar with GDPR. Um, but then I'll turn it over to Susan and we'll talk about some research that really is pretty unusual um, in the marketplace right now. So the three things that I want you to keep in mind as you get into this. The first, um, and I look at the list of companies and the list of participants here, and I'm perhaps speaking to the choir here a bit, but there is a tendency when I talk to folks to think that GDPR is something that is this European phenomenon and um, um, and as a U.S. company, I don't really have to worry about it. And so um, congratulations to all of you all for being here today because I think you understand that um, while the origins of GDPR um, are in Europe, the implications are really global in nature. And so um, anybody that basically does business has customers in Europe, which is just about any company of any scale, um, needs to think about this um, in terms of the implications, the immediate compliance implications, um, beginning in May next year. The second thing, though, I think is the other thing I think is important to keep in mind about all this is that um, my personal opinion is that uh, GDPR is just the tip of the privacy iceberg. Um, you know, we are on the verge of all sorts of government and regulatory authorities trying to wrestle with this question of what privacy means in a mobile and connected era because it's very, very different than it was 10 years ago. And, you know, when we all started carrying around these devices in our pockets and started interacting um, with processes and organizations with them, you know, we basically changed the terms of engagement of what privacy was all about. So I think GDPR is important because it's a bellwether. It's an indicator of what we're going to have to deal with over the next two, three, four years as privacy expands in terms of government jurisdiction and legal jurisdiction. The third thing, I think, and this is where Susan will come in in a few minutes that I think is particularly exciting, is that, you know, we've been following this, and AIM has published a variety of different things, but I'll be honest with you, one of the things that's a limitation in the marketplace right now is a lack of very practical experience about what people are actually doing. Um, there's an awful lot of conversation about what people should be doing, about the implications of not doing it, about some of the risks associated with it, um, but very few um, examples of people that have rolled up their sleeve and really talked to customers and gotten a sense of what this is all about in a real practical world. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what Susan has to say, because um, as far as I know, this is research that hasn't really been shared anywhere else, and I think it's, it's important research moving ahead. So by way of backdrop, you know, what I wanted to do is just set the stage a bit uh, before diving in in more detail and start with this, you know, notion that um, GDPR is an indicator of a growing set of information privacy and security concerns. And so when you think about this, and here's just a couple of data points to think about, is that um, when you look at the question of breaches, for example, as an indicator of concern about privacy, you know, data breaches have increased 40% between 2015 and 2016. And when you think about the cost of a breach, um, the average breach is $4 million. So the financial stakes, the direct financial stakes, and I would argue that kind of the indirect financial and reputational stakes are even higher than the direct financial ones, are significant and growing. Second thing is that when you start looking at what people are doing, and this uh, Telstra cybersecurity report that's mentioned here says that 60% of organizations surveyed lack sufficient security and privacy staff to handle increasing obligations. So on the one hand, you have the risks and challenges growing, and on the other hand, you have a mismatch of resource, resources in order to deal with it. And then kind of the third reason, you know, if you think about popular um, awareness of this, and this is, I think, something that ultimately winds up changing some of the feeling about privacy in the United States. Um, privacy in the United States has always been something that's viewed as somewhat of a tradable good, as opposed to in Europe it's viewed as more of a human right. But when people start thinking about what happened with Equifax and they start thinking about whether they have any recourse um, with regards to that, it starts getting people thinking about this in a different way than they had before. And you can basically go just about every week or every other week, and there's some breach out there that ties back to this question 
of information security and information privacy. We just had the Uber one um, last week, and you know the fact that that was kept hidden for a year before it was actually released. So the the concerns and stakes um, are growing. So I think the thing, as I mentioned earlier, about GDPR to keep in in mind is that. Um, these are regulations for anyone with European customers. So um, it's not just uh, European companies, but anybody with European customers. And the implications of GDPR, I should have defined my acronym in, in the beginning, I apologize, General Data Protection Regulation, um, coming out of the EU, is that it will totally revamp how we process and store personal information of European Union citizens. And so that's a really important aspect of that, because just about any company at scale has some dealings with European Union citizens. Um, and the other aspect of this is that it goes into effect in May of 2018, so that's just around the um, uh, just around the bend. And the fines can be significant. So if you look at the little fine print over on the right there, fines can be up to 20 million euro or 4% of global turnover, and then the always um, tricky phrase, whichever is greater. So the implications of this from a financial as well as a reputational perspective are significant, and I think that it starts to indicate um, a growing set of concerns that we're going to all have to deal with re with regards to um, information privacy and security. So when you think about this in terms of what are the elements, and um, I'm not going to try to pretend um, that I am a lawyer, uh, much less a European lawyer, um, and so um, so don't take this as legal advice. I ought to have one of those little caveats at the bottom of the screen that says not to interpret this as legal advice. I'm sure uh, Susan will say the same thing when she gets on here. But where this came from, just to kind of put it in a little bit of context, quick refresher, um, it replaced existing privacy law. Um, in December of 2015, an agreement was reached. It led to the adoption of the GDPR in April of 2016. And the important provisions to keep in mind about all of this, as you think about it, are this idea of the right to be forgotten, I've seen that in the popular press, this idea that you have to have a defensible process for proving compliance, and you have to make that information available to auditors, this idea that data has to be portable, and that in a lot of different aspects that you have to express affirmative, clear consent to be communicated with. Um, it's not enough to have those negative opt-ins anymore. So that's a little refresher. We have an e-book, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, that can give you some of the details if you're interested. But what I really want to do is hop directly into this question and turn the microphone over to Susan. I want to look at at four areas of GDPR and ask her to talk a little bit about this question of how some of the research, some of the companies that they talk to are dealing practically with these questions. And so the first thing has to do with how GDPR fits into the organization's goals and how are they prioritizing it. So let me turn this over to, to you, Susan, and then uh, I'll come back with a couple questions along the way. Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. And like John, I am not an attorney, but what I do have for you today are findings that we're sharing for the first time in a meeting like this that's based on some primary research that we conducted during the October-November timeframe. We talked to six clients in four industries. Three of them are oil and gas, one company each for apparel manufacturing, food and beverage, and specialty chemicals. They're all global companies. Five of them are public companies. One is government owned. Although the study is small, in my opinion, it provides substantive insights on what to do about GDPR and how you can get started. We, and I do want to note, too, that we do expect to explore technology use for GDR implementation in future research that we're doing. So the first question we asked was, on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest priority, where do you rank GDPR implementation in, as it compares to other organization-wide implementations that might be going on? And among these six companies, the priorities were all over the place. They ranged from 2.5 to four. 
interviewees did think that companies that uh, are consumer facing, like Amazon and Facebook and Google came up several times, are go going to be at the most risk. They're going to be easy targets. But it was interesting with our oil and gas companies, if they're, they operate upstream, and that's where the exploration and production goes on, the personal data is primarily about employees. But as you work down the stream of oil and gas, down to retail uh, and, and service stations, there is more exposure to GDPR because many of these retail companies have reward programs, and so they do have personal information. Also, it was interesting to me that the exposure to the apparel manufacturer also was limited to employee data because their customers are stores and, and not individuals. The food and beverage uh, response was also um, worth mentioning. They actually had two different priorities. For the pedigree animal subsidiary, it, they said it was probably a four because it's all international business. But for the rest of the company, it's a two or a three because system, system integration projects are getting a higher priority right now because uh, of the volume of acquisitions, and so there's decommissioning and data migration involved. But regardless of priority, there is some urgency to get going on this. And these public companies that, that, that we talked to have been working on this for at least a year. Now, um, I wasn't surprised that the groups working on GDPR are multidisciplinary because there are a couple reasons for that. Implementation is going to require comprehensive changes across multiple business units. And the other reason is that personal data can be in so many locations. And it can be in, in electronic and it can be, can be on paper as well. Most of the uh, multidisciplinary teams were comprised of IT, legal, security, privacy, records management, and the business unit. Uh, sometimes uh, purchasing and HR were also a part of these teams. One company started by identifying the critical records, and those are the ones that have the highest risk, the highest value, especially those that contain uh, personally identifiable information like PII and personal health information, or PHI. And as they identify these critical records, the um, information management folks in the business contact the staff to determine where these records are located, and then they develop processes to protect the data. Also, they're going through a process, which you'll probably have to as well, which is identifying the business managed applications, which have been uh, procured and are managed by the business rather than by IT. Question I had along on the, just I was thinking a little bit about uh, let me go back because this point um, I thought was interesting, Susan, this point about uh, EU safe harbor privacy principles and yes. the folks the, the, the fact that people were saying that they'd been working ten years um, on that. Um, one of the things that's changed is that the first set of pr safe harbor principles went into effect in like ninety ninety eight and two thousand and they were overturned in October twenty fifteen and replaced by kind of a safe harbor 2.0, if you will, another set of um, approaches. Um, do people understand that the approaches are different? Um, um, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about how they're different and just give a sense of whether people understand that transition that's underway. Well, first of all, we have to set the UK's Brexit matter aside. Uh, <laughs> aside from that, the purpose of GDPR is to harmonize privacy requirements across the EU. And I've heard others say this is the first time that something was issued that's intended to be the law of all the countries that are part of the EU and not just a directive uh, telling companies that you have to come up with laws to follow the GDPR. And I think that uh, AIM's ebook on information and security really summarized it best. They said that in many ways the EU is leading the way towards a fundamental overhaul of privacy protection that brings it in line with the realities of digital commerce. And I found this particularly meaningful. Resistance may be both futile and counterproductive to the promotion and growth of digital commerce. So clearly, um, organizations need to take a look at this and, and, and not be a, a hurdle, but to be part of the flow of, of the growth of digital commerce. And for the folks that want to jump ahead, the, um, 
AIM eBook is in the resources list right now, so if you want to download that, feel free. Um, it's, it's really a very good thing. It was written by, uh, uh, I'm listed as a co-author, but I will tell you that the brains of the outfit is um, a fellow named Andrew Peary, who's a certified privacy ex executive, and he kind of understands this stuff at a depth that gets beyond me. So it's really a good resource, and so take a look at it. So. Um, let's talk a little bit about noncompliance and the risks of noncompliance. Do people kind of get that? What's their take on that, Susan? Well, if anybody in the audience listening um, believes that GDPR applies to them and they haven't started on implementation or they're choosing not to do anything, it's really important that you have clarity on what the consequences are. And we know about the potential fines, as you, as John, you mentioned here in the sidebar. The fines are very clearly defined. What's not clear is what are the potential risks. And everybody, one of the, when we talk about GDPR with people, they, they, we always speculate, so who's going to, who are they going to come after first? And again, it seems like these consumer-facing companies that you're all familiar with, they seem like an easy target. Um, also, we think that companies with data breaches will be targeted. And also companies against which compliance about GDPR noncompliance have been lodged. Now, many think that the European auditors just don't currently have the bandwidth to enforce compliance on the scale that they desire. However, these auditors are permitted to use the sanctions to fund their compliance enforcement. So there's that. So in terms of what happens when noncompliance is discovered, we just don't know yet. We just don't know. Now, some thought leaders have, have begun to wonder if the impact of GDPR could be reminiscent of the Y2K scare. And our team did some research, and popular to maybe what many people believe, there were effects felt um, after the Y2K scare. Uh, we documented a number of, of things that happened. Uh, U.S. spy satellites were unusable for three days. We had seven nuclear reactors um, that experienced glitches in the beginning of January. So it's, the, the, the effects were not insignificant. The bottom line is that without knowing the full extent of the potential risk, can your organization afford to become the poster child for GDPR noncompliance? And I think the answer is probably no. So I don't know if you've looked at the GDPR itself. There are 99 articles, and the thing is 261 pages long. Article 5, paragraph 2, is, is called the accountability principle. And it requires organizations to demonstrate compliance with GDPR principles. And we ask uh, interviewees how they plan to do that. And one of the things that they agreed upon, all six of them, is that metadata is going to be key to connecting the dots to demonstrate compliance. But at least among these, these six, no clear best practices have emerged. A couple of things mentioned are, 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 are noted here, uh, possibly maintaining a central catalog of GDPR metadata for all personal information. Uh, another option mentioned was embedding GDPR-related metadata into source information systems and repositories. And also, you're probably going to need to revisit your retention schedule to make sure that includes records that contain personal data and that they're addressed. So this example, I'm going to give you an example, and this is for the, the members of the audience who have to be responsible for their retention schedules. And many of you know that that's what I, I spent a lot of my career developing retention schedules, scaling them down with the big bucket approach. So we're always trying to have as few record series or buckets as possible. For, for customer data, if there's a contract or a transaction or a PO, and that represents a documented reason to have the data in one of their systems, the retention period, um, this is the example provided to, to us, it's life of the customer relationship plus some number of years. And that has served us well, but now with the new privacy and data protection requirements, uh, one of the companies had to add two new record series for loyalty type customers, and they wanted them necessarily to have shorter retention periods because that life of the customer relationship could be a long retention period. So they added two new record series. One is con customer data consent granted, 
with current year plus some number of years, and then customer data consent withdrawn, which is current year plus some number few of days this time. It's much shorter. And if consent is withdrawn or a customer has been inactive for a year, the records are reclassified um, from the first to the second and so on. And if data could be classified to either record series, the company made a risk-based decision which is if there is a documented business need, say a contract or a PO, the longer retention is automatically applied. Uh, I just want to mention vendors. You probably have got multiple vendors managing your data. Um, HR benefits comes to mind, and there will likely have to be uh, provisions around contract management responsibilities that you'll, you'll also need to look into. Yeah, that last piece, I think, uh, Susan, is particularly interesting to me because um, it's hard enough to do this on um, places that you immediately control it. <laughs> Never mind uh, extending that into the contractor base becomes a lot more a lot more challenging. Um, sure. What I want to do You're now right. is switch, switch a little bit into how people are viewing this from a management perspective. Kind of, um, you know, how are they getting started? What what are they thinking about with regards to setting up a team to deal with this? so on and so on. Thanks, John. As, as John said, the, the, these companies, all six of them, they, they all started at least a year ago. And so what we're going to talk about is what they did in that, uh, during that year. Five of the six formed teams to address implementation. Most employed a project management methodology that's certainly not unique to GDPR initiatives and honestly could be applied to implementation of any compliance initiative. A one organization had an internal team and outside consultants, altogether about 20 people. The internal employees are part-time, the consultants are full-time. Another organization appointed a full-time chief privacy officer a year ago. They have decided on a council structure uh, comprised of the chief privacy officer, regional owners around the globe, and subject matter experts, including the records and information manager, manage, manager to help out with this GDPR project. And then another project is run out of data privacy, and it has a project sponsor, uh, a project owner, and a steering committee. Setting up this multidisciplinary team is familiar to most of you, and honestly not all that difficult once you've got senior leadership attention and support. So the next thing we want to look at is, so they got a team, what happened next? Well, the order may be different in terms of what they did first, second, and third, but the public companies all did the following. They had to conduct a, a gap assessment. And as I said, there are 99 articles that companies have to, that are held, they're, they're held accountable for. And so the organizations are going to have to review them and put together at least a high-level gap analysis and identify what needs to be done to close those gaps. A second uh, task is to create a data map or an inventory of personal data. Uh, a couple of these organizations have been identifying personal data for years through mapping and data flows as part of the process, but they, as they said, GDPR requires it on steroids. And that they have already made many changes in their systems and processes, but they still, and, and now they need to update their data maps accordingly. And the, these two things that I've mentioned, the gap assessment and the data map, do require some effort and some specialized expertise. So most of the organizations did acquire outside help um, to develop the data maps, to conduct the inventories, um, consultants to make sure they get the security classifications right, and outside counsel for legal advice. You didn't mention uh training and change management. Did, did any of the companies mention that? Well, the reality is if GDPI applies to your organization at some point, you're going to have to train all at least some of your employees and maybe and more likely all of them. And certainly for those organizations that have already invested in training systems and privacy training, um, it's going to be a much easier transition to get people trained up. One of our respondents said that they mentioned an earlier uh, initiative that requires general information management and, and protection training for all employees. So obviously it's going to be easier for them 
to adapt their training and, and to build it and, and, and to include the new requirements. So I think, in my opinion, what's happening here regarding training and change management is that organizations, first of all, they've got to figure out what, that, what needs to be done. And then the training, the change management, the tools, the technical solutions come a little bit later in the process. Interesting, and yeah, we've, we've seen in our surveys too that there's um, there, there are some organizations that are committed to training and some that aren't, and uh, I have a feeling that those gaps are going to increase as people try to fit GDPR training into what they currently do. The kind of the ones that already are committed probably will have an easier ones that are starting from scratch. So let's talk about this question of uh, of looking at this not not just from a of a point compliance. GDPR perspective, but from the point of view of um, what it says about sustaining privacy models. So let's talk a little bit about that and what you found from the. Sure. Um, John, every one of these companies and their interviewees said that GDPR compliance is going to require comprehensive changes to their business practices. And then on top of that, we've got privacy requirements around the world are ratcheting, ratcheting up, some of which we suspect may be more stringent than GDPR. And so how in the world is your organization going to sustain these changes and, and yet still be adaptable to, to what's coming down the pike? And as I mentioned, there are just going to be more regs and more fines and more sanctions. So um, one of the things that's going on, did I skip a slide? I did. Uh, potential, there are potential changes. Um, and it's not just, I mean, there are all kinds of related practices and processes that need to be uh, coordinated. In our study, um, you'll see in the sidebar that one of our organizations, what really brought, um, was a driver for talking about GDPR is that they began to look at how to apply GDPR across their global uh, operations. They don't have one centralized HR system. They've got multiple. And, and so they realize that that's going to make it more difficult and more complicated with different locations, different systems, and different securities. So they have, are also looking at moving to a global system. Um, also, you're, you're going to have to, there are going to be gaps between the retention schedule and GDPR. Uh, a couple of examples came up in our study. One is related to hotline calls. Many of you probably know that Sarbanes-Oxley required all publicly traded companies to have a reporting function that's confidential, that's anonymous, and uh, companies established internal hotlines to be able to satisfy that requirement. But on the other hand, many EU member states, they, they have their hurdles for hotlines, such as restrictions against hotlines accepting anonymous reports. So companies are going to have to find ways to reconcile these different regulations because these companies cannot afford to jeopardize the status um, as a publicly traded company. And this is just one example. Um, I, they told me about two or three others, don't have time for all of that. But when there is friction between your retention schedule and the GDPR, you're going to have to decide on the best action dependent on the end goal, the degree of need for information the potential fines, and, and all of those things. So it's very hard to avoid, for companies to avoid uh, GDPR compliance. And I want to talk, so one of the questions that you need to consider if you haven't already is what, do you, what kind of program are you going to have? Are you going to have one program for all countries? Are you going to have a program tailored to regions and countries? Are you going to have local programs? All three of those alternatives might be appropriate for one or another company. So in our example here in the sidebar, what they hope to do is take lessons learned from the, e the EU and roll it out globally. But they're watching Australia and China because they know they're working on some privacy requirements. And, 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 but nonetheless, they are hopeful that the, what they learn with the EU data can be used elsewhere. Now, another company said that their program is driven primarily out of Europe. However, um, they made a decision to implement globally regardless of the country for all the businesses. And they have gone, um, moved, they have established da data privacy focal points. So they've really reached out into the organization and they are already providing additional training for these folks. 
So maybe what you could do now is just give us a quick little summation of what you found in talking to these six companies. And then as you do so, maybe you could also comment on whether you think all these conversations about GDR, GDPR could finally open up a wedge to have a broader conversation about information governance in organizations, something we've all been talking about for some time? Sure. So to sum all this up, it, it's, it's not too late to get started. You need to establish a structure and a team and some resources for implementation. You're probably going to have to leverage outside resources to get the special expertise that you might need. Um, you're going to have to find, you're going to have to know where your personal data are uh, and inventory them. Uh, gap assessments have been very effective against all 99 um, articles. So th these are uh, simple, fundamental steps that you need to take, but very comprehensive. And I do want to note that uh, th this research was focused on planning for GDR implementation. Um, in a few months' time, as companies begin implementing plans to close the gaps, we do expect to study the tools and technologies used in the process. So stay tuned for our, our, future, our, our, our future research on this. And to answer your questions about a uh, broader conversation about information governance, John, I, I, I reviewed my interview notes, and two of them absolutely said yes. If companies have the proper information controls in place, data privacy is just another aspect of that. And, that, and they think that GDPR implementation gives information management professionals a good opportunity to raise awareness about information management in general. Another one of our respondents said this is a huge opportunity for RIM and information governance. Um, they plan to use technical tools to identify rot in their primary repository and then decide what to do with it and when. And they've experimented one department, so this company thinks that this GDPR opportunity is going to help them cleanse data that's no longer necessary and in the end improve regulatory compliance and overall information governance, including litigations and tax holes. So absolutely, John, there's a huge opportunity here. That's great. Thank you so much, Susan, and uh, I'm glad to hear that. I, I really like your, um, your quote over here on the, on the side, this is a journey, not an event, and I think <laughs> We've all struggled um, at AIM and at ARMA and, you know, all the other organizations that have something to do with governance and information management of trying to figure out how you get people to pay attention <laughs> and to pay attention in a holistic way rather than in a point way. And um, so hopefully GDPR can help make that happen. Um, I'd like to switch to Cynthia Wood. Um, Cynthia is the Senior VP of Sales and Marketing at Gimmel, and to just give us a little sense about um, their product portfolio and how they line up against some of the issues that we just talked about. So, Cynthia, let me hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, John. And Gimmel is really proud to be a sponsor of the GDPR eBook and a supporter of AIM, and very, uh, very honored to be on the call today with you. Uh, just a couple of uh, Key things about Gimel, if we were sitting with you all talking about some of the problems that we solve, we could spend a lot of time just really digging into some of the challenges that um, a, a regulatory requirement like GDPR presents uh, to organizations. And you mentioned it earlier, John, it's around really being able to easily govern information, enforcing the consist consistency of that information and the architecture of that information, and increasingly across many, many systems. Um, you know, organizations have historically been very challenged in getting people to tag content and, and being able to make that information more easily accessible and searched. And that's directly where the Gimbal solutions focus, as well as making information policy easy to, to apply across systems, uh, centralizing that control and making it easy for uh, security and records professionals to to enforce those policies across systems uh, so that uh, when, when a requirement uh, like uh, the right to be forgotten, um, you know, comes up, you have an auditable way to ensure that your organization is in compliance. Additionally, just focusing on um, the, the challenges around user experience with these systems and then the complexity of tying all that to transactions that happen or events that happen that affect uh, things like information life cycle and disposition. This is squarely where our solutions um, help our customers uh, solve these challenges. 
if you think about it from the perspective of what many organizations are trying to achieve, which is a better digital workplace, um, really trying to eliminate uh, the technology silos that you see on the far left there uh, with better controls so that individuals can achieve their business goals uh, much, much faster. Um, reducing the risk, innovating, you know, uh, employing top talent or things that individuals want to be able to focus on, not trying to find information or navigate systems. So again, this is where the, the Gimmel solutions really fit, making all of that very automated, uh, making it very transparent to the end user, making it very easy across uh, systems to, to eliminate those silos and to continue to surface high value content and to dispose of content in an auditable and defensible way so that content is um, up to date. And that by doing that, we really let the organization focus on what really matters to them, achieving their business goals and achieving governed and managed information throughout the organization. Just a couple of things about uh, Gimmel and what makes us better. We have a very strong relationship with Microsoft and with SAP. Uh, they're leading technology partners with us and we're, we're very uh, innovative alongside those platforms uh, to take advantage of many of the technologies that they're bringing to market, things like Microsoft's ADG and some of the exciting innovations that they're putting in Office 365, but embracing and extending that so that the controls um, can be uh, more easily managed and so that we can do those do those things across many different systems. We often find that our customers have, you know, 15 systems of record and many collaborative platforms with content uh, that resides in a lot of places. So eliminating those silos, making it easy for end users. And then, you know, we also, um, our platforms are certified by some of the strictest standards in the world. We're certainly certified by our leading technology partners, but also by the US DOD standard for records management. There are some resources that we've made available uh, to the folks on the webinar and that will be hosted in the resources section as well, and I've listed those here. And with that, I will turn it back over to Teresa and let her, her uh, wrap us up. Why, thank you. Um, we've been listening to John Mancini and Susan Sisko and Cynthia Wood, um, Susan and Cynthia from Gimmel. And uh, just leaving this link up here for the, the few of the resources that are available to you. Um, as Cynthia mentioned, they are listed in the resources section um, to the right of your slide area, or if you download a PDF of the slides that we have in there, um, you will also have um, access to uh, this same information. So um, really good resources. Uh, highly encourage you to make, uh, avail yourself of all, all the information that's in there. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in, and I just want to uh, try to get to as many of these as we can here. And Cynthia, I want to direct this first question over to you. And someone is asking about um, you know, with the importance of automation uh, and, and the, fa the, failure, the failure of manual approaches. Uh, and I realize with records management practices in general, that's, that's an important issue. Um, but can you talk a little bit about that and, and how that re and, and then the value of, of, of uh, eliminating manual approaches? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it really starts with uh, the, the beginning of the life cycle of content, right, being able to tag it. And so, you know, the more that you ask users to tag content and to enter information about it, the less likely they are to actually uh, manage the information. So by um, using tools to allow you to inherit that tagging, um, by knowing where that data is being stored, um, who the user is that's storing it, what what uh, functional repository it's being managed in. There's an awful lot that we can automate in the way that the information is actually um, entered in the system to begin with intelligently. Um, in addition to that, as it's working its way through the life cycle, uh, again, being able to apply the right policies at the right times, even changing things like uh, the security levels, um, as something perhaps becomes, uh, you know, works its way from being a draft document into a final record, um, security policies may change, locations may need to change. Um, again, automating that so an end user doesn't have to be trained to do all of that, but making it very easy for them to simply work in their systems and to manage their information 
uh, without needing to, um, you know, drag and drop to a different location or um, add uh, a classification to a record, for example, and making that very seamless is, is critically important to adoption and to uh, success with, with automation. Thank you. Now, Susan, I want to ask this next question of you. Uh, someone asked, uh, for the companies that you interviewed, do they have a go-forward plan for maintaining compliance? Thank you, Teresa. I would say that the, the uh, GDPR compliance is so comprehensive that it definitely takes a lot of study and analysis to figure out what you need to do, and do they have a go forward, uh, how to best demonstrate compliance? What the what the six told me is that um, there there isn't a best practice. They all told me different approaches, including uh, a central catalog of GDPR related metadata or putting GDPR metadata into repositories. You know, there's so potentially so many systems and so many locations for data that. I don't know that there's going to be one common way to do it. I think that's what's um, kind of startling a lot of organizations is that you're going to have to prioritize where your risk is biggest and you're going to have to develop strategies one by one, just take the highest risk then the next highest and to where you can identify patterns and do a more global approach. But I didn't see yet any best practices. I think when we come back to this and look again and maybe uh, six months to a year, I may be able to give a better answer to that question. I think that's a real okay. important point that, that you mentioned there, Susan, is that ultimately um, there aren't cookie cutters here. I think sometimes there tends to be, uh, you know, when you get out into the solution provider realm, sometimes people assume that there are, and um, there really aren't, and this is really at the heart of it. Um, for most organizations, it's a risk management and risk mitigation strategy in which they, they have to figure out where they're, they're not going to be perfect, and so they have to figure out where their highest vulnerabilities are and attack those first. I agree 100% on that, John. And Susan, I want to ask, uh, we have time for one more question here, and I want to squeeze this one in. Someone had asked, you know, how best to demonstrate GDPR compliance via records management. And I know in your, um, in, in your discussion you had mentioned that one of the clients you interviewed had um, added to their retention schedule. Um, are there other ideas or suggestions that you can put out there for people to consider? Let me think about that for a moment. <laughs> Cynthia, do you have any ideas on that one? I kind of exhausted what, what my interviewees told me. Uh, yeah, no, I think we kind of addressed some of that through the through the dialogue um, as well. Just but with I think, good records management practices and documenting that and enforcing that. I would agree. And it always And comes automating back to, that. And automating that, good. yes. <laughs> yes. Good point. And that the retention schedule is really your best line of defense because uh, we want to get rid of unnecessary, especially personal data, um, but what is, so, so viewing this as an opportunity, the clients I work with have, have been working to get rid of rot for years and using tools, and, uh, it, but, but there's so much rot in organization. It can be as much as 70 to 80 percent of the information in your organization is redundant, obsolete, or trivial, or has expired retention periods. So let's leverage this as a way to identify where the duplication and the redundancy and the unnecessary information are stored, and then let's get rid of it through a defensible uh, process based on the records retention schedule. Okay. Um, well, I just want to mention a couple other things here that AIM has going on right now. Um, and our, we're working towards our annual conference. It's going to be in April um, of next year, and it's going to be in San Antonio. And so if you go to aimconference.com, and there is a link to it in the resources, uh, there's 
working every day for adding more speakers and exciting keynotes are, are get, being lined up for this, and lots of educational sessions and a lot of roundtable discussions. Very valuable um, for those roundtable talks to be brainstorming and, and uh, comparing notes and, and talking with your peers. And so uh, do come to our website and check out uh, the information for the AIM conference and register, because if you register before the end of January, uh, you're getting the early bird pricing there. Also want to mention um, that AIM offers live instructor-led training as well as online self-paced classes, and you can thoroughly immerse yourself with deep dive courses or just uh, take some quick study offerings. And we can even arrange for a trainer to come to your place of business and provide custom perspective to our instructor-led programs. So that really puts a personal edge uh, for your organization. So info on all of that can be found at aim.org slash training. And as we are at the end of our webinar hour, just want to remind you we've recorded this and it's going to be available in the next day or two at aim.org's resources webinars page. Also that this webinar is eligible for one hour of maintenance credits for the CIP or your CRM. Um, don't forget to download the resources that are um, to the right of the slide area. And also when the webinar is over, that survey is going to open on your desktop. And I greatly value your feedback and would love to hear from you. And I definitely want to thank our underwriter, Gimmel. Without the support from our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to bring you these free educational programs like our webinar. So Gimmel, thank you for your sponsorship. It is greatly appreciated. And as we bring the webinar to a close, I just want to leave you with our the closing thoughts or key takeaways from our speakers today. And so I'm going to start first with um, Cynthia Wood from Gimmel. From Gimmel. Um, your closing thoughts today. So my closing thoughts are, you know, we talked about breaches being sort of similar to this and that, you know, there are huge fines. But in my mind, I'm from Texas, so I'd say a breach is kind of like a random act of violence to an organization. And GDPR is really a targeted and intentional assault by a government entity to ensure that businesses are taking information privacy and information protection seriously. And organizations, um, it's inherently important that organizations be able to respond. Um, my real takeaway in all of this is that it's driving tremendous innovation by technology providers, uh, large and small, to ensure that um, enterprises are able to do this in uh, easier, more meaningful uh, ways. And I think that's a, a plus plus for um, for all involved. Thanks, Cynthia. And Susan Sisko from Gimmel, your closing thoughts today. Bottom line, it's not too late to get started. You need to uh, uh, leverage project management methodology, get a team, get some structure, get some resources, uh, figure out what needs to be done, prioritize that, and, and, and get working on uh, solutions that will fill the gap. And as Cynthia was alluding, the tools and technology will be there to support you once you figure out exactly what you need to do. And closing words from John Mancini of AIM. Uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit. And there were, um, there were three quotes uh, that Susan, and, um, um, Susan had along the way. And I think Cynthia reinforced them. Um, and I, they, 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 I they were, they, I wrote them down because it, it really uh, they struck me. The, the first one is that there's not one common cookie cutter way to approach this, that it is all dependent on the individual circumstances of a company and organization. Second one was this is a journey, not an event. I think that's really important in terms of thinking about raising the primacy of information governance and of information security and privacy in organizations as an institutional priority as opposed to something that just records management people care about. And then on a practical level, um, I really like the quote, uh, your retention schedule is your best line of defense. And I think that's a good practical way of starting to think about where you get started. Thank you, John. Um, and that is all we have time for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for AIM. This is Teresa Resick, and we'll see you next time. And have a great afternoon.